Started. Welcome, everyone. Um, I figured I was either going to have a full house or an empty house, so thanks all for stopping by. Um, this is the Big Tandy Systems. Um, the least known of the Tandy Systems, kind of the least appreciated in my mind, um, but also a pretty fascinating architecture and something kind of worth, worth your time. Um, historically, these machines haven't been the most accessible uh, to folks, especially, you know, average everyday hobbyists such as myself. So a lot's changed in the last few years that has made these systems really accessible. And even if you can't get a hold of the hardware, a lot has changed. Um, there's also two things I kind of hope to get through with this presentation. The first is A, that this is a really fantastic architecture and it's worth your time. And B, that one of the most common pieces of feedback I get in talking with folks is that there's nothing happening in Tandy. Where's the hardware? Where's the software? From the outside, it just kind of looks like a black box with a bunch of folks from Texas who made computers once. As there's a lot more to it, and for just what's available for these systems now, you should be able to extrapolate from that. The more popular systems, the 134 line of Z80 systems, the color computers, have a lot of hardware and software available for them. You have to know where to look. Um, and I kind of had a similar experience uh, when I got an Apple II. There was a, a floppy emu. I was looking for a floppy emulator. You don't know which one's a good when you're trying to navigate other people's social circles and documentation and things like that. Um, and it's hard to break those silos. So who am I? Um, I'm Christopher Heiser, I, Chris, but we run the, run the names together, it sounds weird, aka online TJB Chris. So if anybody here watches my YouTube channel, thanks. Um, if anybody here doesn't, don't expect much. Um, I was a typical Radio Shack kid. Uh, the grocery store that my parents shopped at was at the end of a mall, a mall in upstate New York that's two strip malls put together with a roof over top of them. And I would hightail it over to Radio Shack. They knew me by name, I knew them by name. And I was particularly lucky because my Radio Shack was an 01 store. Does anybody know what that means? No. It was a Radio Shack plus computer center. So it had the additional Tandy line of systems that you didn't find in your everyday Radio Shack. You could play with a Tandy 3000 or a Tandy 5000 MC. Uh, my first computer was a Tandy Color Computer 3. It informs my entire approach to my career and my life. The OS 9 operating system is rather Indifferent, but it is, has a lot of Unix-like, POSIX-like qualities to it. So it was my introduction to multi-user. You can do multi-user on a Color Computer 3, believe it or not, via the serial port. Uh, the idea of processes, piped, redirection, basic file security, all of this stuff was actually available on a Color Computer back in the 1980s, which is really cool. Um, I was immediately interested in Tandy's computers. I was already an electronics dork, a Radio Shack electronics dork or by the time I got the computer. So this just got me into that. I began collecting in my teens. First with the TRS-80 Model 4 that I bought for $25, including a 132 column DMP 400 printer. Uh, the light dimmer, as I called it, when you printed, the lights would dim. <laughs> and I don't know what that says. Uh, I got a Tandy 1000 SX a few years later. I don't have that one anymore. I do still have the original Model 4, but um, the 1000SX is gone. I do have another one that I saved from a dumpster, though, um, with its original boxes. And one of the things I think is most underappreciated about Radio Shack, why Radio Shack computers, what's good about them? Well, picture 1986, 1987. At one time, you had at least six or seven different architectures in one place at one time, entirely alien foreign architectures available to you at one time. You've got the color computer with the 6809. The Model 4 was in the catalog until 1990, so that was a Z80. You had the 68000 systems that we're going to talk about today. You had the 80C85s for the Model 100. You had the PC systems, the x86s and the like, and you also had the pocket computers. So there was a plethora of machines you could go play with entirely foreign architectures, complete machines with entirely different sets of software and operating standards. It was a really cool place to be, and you could do this all in one place. Um, and I don't know of any other manufacturer that had that breadth available on a consumer level. This is my collection as of February. I own almost all of the lines of machines. The only one I don't have is a Tandy 2000. Um, but I have, there's more Model 4s. I have about four of those. There are some non Tandy machines in there. There's a Commodore 64 you can see in the box in the back. Behind me is an Apple IIe Platinum. And I also have a Dell Dimension XPS T600R. And like every other person, I bought an Abu. So, it never comes out, but I bought an Abu. It's a neat machine. Um, so that's my collection, and I do have a YouTube channel. It's very niche. Um, I have about 3,500 subscribers or so. I also play shopping channel host. That video on the right is me grokked up the graphics for QVC on OBS, and I stand in front of the camera and pretend to sell things. 
it's fun. I don't know why I do it. Um, the channel is not, I don't have a Patreon. Um, I don't have my hat out per se. So there are limits as to how much polish this channel will have. Um, so like I said, I don't expect much, but I do have a lot of fun with these machines. I do occasionally drink on camera and I do occasionally swear on camera. So I try and keep it to a dull roar because some people, uh, especially in the community, do share my content. So you can check that out. Okay, so let's talk about the Big Tandy systems. There are five. Starting in, and Big Tandy, by the way, when I say Big Tandy, these are the Tandy business systems. Big Tandy systems are the only systems with the 8-inch floppy drives, and some of the systems have the 68,000 processors set in them. So they are starting in 1979, the Model 2. And the Model 2, with its uh, single-sided, always-running floppy drive, 110-volt AC motor in that thing, if you go play with some of the exhibits, over in the Tandy assembly side, you can hear the head solenoid clamp down on the media and watch the screen dip a bit every time you access the floppy drive. Um, great machine. And these machines were the kind of the business answer to the Model 1. The Model 1 was not really good for, for business. Next up, we had the Model 16. This added the 68,000 processor set. But at the time, nothing made use of it. Tandy got sued for this. Um, Tristos 16 had a reputation and a name, Bowling Ball DOS. Why? Why is the Model 16 like a bowling ball? It was written in the 80 Micro magazine. Because you can get about the same amount of software for each. <laughs> they eventually fixed this with uh, Xenix, which is its own little story. Uh, the Model 12 is next. That kind of replaced the Model 2, more consolidated. Prettier case, believe it or not, bigger than the Model 2. These things are beasts. Next up, the Model 16B. Uh, just kind of the 16 translated into Model 12 form factor. And finally, in 1985, the Tandy 6000. And so... Three of these machines, the 16 and 6000, 16B, have the 68000 processor, the 2 and the 12 do not by default. And the 12 has its own little additional limitation that we'll talk about. So, with the 16 line systems, this is where the architecture gets kind of unique. What you have really here is a blended architecture. There's two different subsystems in the systems working together that are in one sense independent, but in another sense not. So, on all of the systems, 212 16B 6000, you have a Z80 architecture. Now, this is the same Z80A that you're all familiar with, but on top of it, what you have is additional hardware that was not used in systems like the Model 134. So you had DMA, you had the Z80 SIO, uh, serial IO setup, um, PIO, all that kind of stuff. Um, this made it a much bigger platform, better platform, more robust, separate keyboard and video processors. Um, again, I mentioned the Z80 SIO is its own little beast to get to know. Um, and it's, you know, 64K of addressable RAM, but 32K of that is pageable in 16K and 16 pages. And they're, they're fairly wide 32K pages, but the system platform theoretically allows for up to 512K of RAM. And there are some pieces of software that do use um, some additional RAM. VisiCalc is one. Um, and so this is actually a 12, 16B, 6000, there's an additional 16K that the operating system uses. Um, so um, actually, a neat little fun fact about that. If uh, those of you that use the diagnostics, I see this on YouTube a lot. You see some of the, these machines pop up on some fairly popular channels. I have an 80K Model 12. Why does it say I have 96? Well, Tandy wasn't known for putting extra anything into anything. Um, it's kind of a running joke with Tandy. They tended to like to do the lowest cost. Um, it's a 32K bank, but they only needed 16K, so they mapped it over itself. So the 32K page gets filled with the same 16K. So if you see a Model 12 that says it has 96K of RAM, you probably have 80. Uh, then on the other side, the 16B 6000 adds the 68000 subsystem. So this is a 6, a six megahertz or 8 megahertz Motorola 68000, depending on the system. It sort of supports up to a mega RAM out of the box, but 80s uh, MMU upgrades allowed for upgrades to 4 megabytes from Tandy. Um, this was a really rare item. And there was also third-party add-ons to 8 megabytes, including a modern one now, by a group called Tandy Emeritus. I'll talk about them. Interestingly, the Z80 subsystem is used for all I.O. The 68000 subsystem has no direct access to the hardware on the machine. So if you're talking with a 68000, it has to go through essentially a set of software running on the Z80 side to do that processing for you. And Xenix is, is actually a pretty good example of that. There's a program called Z80 CTL that runs on the 68000 side, takes interrupts driven or other I.O. requests. They too share uh, 68000 and the Z80 have a shared memory window, a 16K memory window that they communicate through. That's how data gets back and forth. So uh, when the 68000 is running, um, the, the Z80 side can tell it which, where in Z80 RAM it wants to read and write, and it can kind of do that. So, um, and again, this is high level because there's a lot to this, and this, this itself could be its own 
couple of presentations. You could really go deep into the platform here. But this by-play, this kind of blended architecture is really, really cool. It's fun to work with, but it also creates confusion when you're kind of working with it. Um, I'm the kind of person, this is where my brain works. Like I like these kind of things. So. So let's take a look. One of the things that the Model 2 really added was expandability. Tandy didn't invent the expansion slot, um, but they did, they did do this um, for these systems. All except the Model 12 have an expansion card bus. So the Models 2 and 16 here, you can see there's a brace. This is not user accessible. These machines you had to pay Radio Shack, pay Radio Shack, whatever, to install cards. Nothing was user serviceable. Um, that didn't stop, folks, of course. On the 1216B6000, the case was redesigned so there's a door on the back and users could manage the cards themselves. Uh, but the Model 12 lacks the card cage. It's just a big metal wall in the back of there. So that um, Radio Shack had a $250 or $300 upgrade, I think, um, that would allow you to add the card cage. But now if you have a Model 12, there's no Radio Shack anymore. Um, now, one interesting thing, the Z80 side, card order matters. You know, you get an IBM PC bus, ISA bus system, you jam the cards in wherever you want for the most part. That's not how this works. Uh, the Z80 system, because of the interrupt and bus master chains that they use for this, not only does the order of the cards matter, closer, first card wins, right? But also, um, the, the chains are carried forward to the next slot by the previous card. So if you pull out a card, um, it, the system won't work right. And so if you have one of these systems and it's not working right, it seems to kind of work, it's acting funny, there's documentation for the card order. The card orders are very important for the Z80 cards. 68,000 cards don't matter. And typically, as you can see, and this is my Model 16 here, there's a gap between the 68,000 cards and the Z80 cards. It's done for really just to keep them separated, but there's no electrically necessary reason for doing this. So why the Tandy big, big Tandy systems? Why would you care about these things or business computers. What got, what got me interested in Tandy systems? Well, books and TV made me do it. I was in, you know, that's imitatable. Books, my local library, my school library had two books that I checked out so often that they had to refix the spine and tape the pages back in. Because I read those same articles over and over again. I really wanted to see these machines. By the time I was old enough to be let to Radio Shack myself, um, that machine wasn't going to show up there anymore. So I really wanted to play with these. I read about them a lot. There wasn't a lot out there. Um, by this time, magazines of the day, 80 Micro still existed, but they had moved on to MS-DOS stuff and Tandy 1000s and the like. Um, and what really got me, anybody watch Mr. Wizard's World on Nickelodeon in the 80s? Uh, I loved that show. Um, and for some unknown reason, they had a Model 12 on there. Why are, I know Nickelodeon just had it floating around. It's like, hey, you need a computer, drag out a Model 12. Um, they did one with scripts it and word processing. They did a stopwatch computer one on it. Um, my favorite was they were doing one on computer graphics that had nothing to do with the Model 12. And to make it computer, they took the Model 12 keyboard and just set it next to the box they were demoing. <laughs> um, but that was good. Um, and it was kind of fun to watch them do that. But now, a lot of this, I'm going to say here, really, the theme applies to all of us now with any of the machines, Apple, Commodore, Tandy, Atari, whatever. Um, Eight-inch systems just make it harder. And there's a lot of things that have made these systems less than accessible. Um, and the biggest ones that I see, lack of familiarity. How many of you here know, beyond the fact that you're sitting here watching me talk about this, anything about these systems? Have, have read about them? Anybody? A couple? Three, four? Yeah? About right. Um, I, they're business machines. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't have much nostalgia for whatever machines I'm working with now, right? Um, you tend not to until the end, and half the time when work's done, I don't want to think about that anymore, right? Um, and, and who's going to be nostalgic for Westlaw terminals and payroll, ledger, scripts it, right? Nobody cares, right? Um, although if you watch any of the color computer folks, the joke is when they do the game on challenge every week, they're going to play scripts it. So I don't know how you score that, but I'd love to know. Um, it's not mass market, right? You didn't see them in regular Radio Shacks unless you had a computer center or something like that or knew somebody that had one, you weren't going to see one of these machines. So there's not really any nostalgia there. And my entry into these machines is nostalgic too. I just happened to read about it as a, as a kid in a book and now I wanted them. Uh, media issues. Eight inch media itself is a barrier. There's less of it. Um, the drives ran a lot. I mentioned the Model 2, that drive runs all the time. It's spinning the entire time. Uh, the later systems, the drives would turn off the motor after 30 seconds of inactivity, but if you did a lot of disk I.O., those drives could be running for hours at a time. These were systems that were typically powered on all day, sometimes multiple days in a row. 
Um, so they saw a lot of miles. Um, worn accordingly, and of course, again, you're sitting there at work, in four years, someone might want this accounting program. I'm going to save it, right? Um, apparently somebody did, though. Uh, but preservation was more difficult. Without specialized hardware, it wasn't accessible to someone like, you know, an average hobbyist like me who's into this but not into it enough to be able to kind of do that myself. I hadn't gotten myself there yet. Uh, as Billy Mays would say, but wait, there's more. More? <laughs> Very few games. I wanted to write no games, but that's not true. In fact, if you want to experience some of the games, check out the Tandy assembly area. There are a couple of Model 2s. There's one up at the Abite Behind table, and there's another one around the corner um, that has, they're mostly text adventure games. Scott Adams Adventures and, and things like that. There are some graphics-ish games, but there's no assembly language arcade action. You're not getting, getting Donkey Kong on there, or, you know, a space, space Invaders or anything like that. Uh, documentation wasn't really accessible online. You have big, if you've ever seen the big Radio Shack binders of documentation, they're some of my favorite ginormous binders of thing. Again, typically discarded with the systems. Businesses get done with these systems, they tend to punt them out to the dumpsters, right? And the software documentation went with them. Again, software, business software, woo, payroll. Um, and again, Adage Media is People like me at the time not really going to be able to do that. And there was not really a centralized community around it. And believe it or not, you may be saying to yourself, oh, but TJB Chris, there's not a community now. Uh, but there is. There's actually really more formalizing people. There's a lot of folks. There's Discord channels, um, Facebook groups, and things like that. And I'll talk about that. And help is hard to find. Usenet was your source um, if you really wanted to do anything with these machines. Were, were there many computer bulletin boards set up for these things back then? These, no. No. Um, hello? OK. But a lot has changed. A lot has changed, and I would say the last 10 years or so, a lot has happened. Um, and I'm somewhat order of importance here, make sure I'm on time here, yes, um, for how these, the biggest development in my mind, floppy emulation, disk emulation. Without access to the software, the computer is useless. And the HXCs, your GoTex, and there is a 30 to 54 or 34 to 50 pin adapter to adapt your standard Shugart style drives to the 50 pin uh, 8 inch standard that were used on these Tandy systems. There's hard drive emulators. There's a, you can use DREM if you have the right interface board. There's a, a drive called the FRED, which is actually a drive solution that was created for the Model 134 line. F48 is the adaptation for the 8 inch systems now, and there's a, other MFM emulators as well. Um, the, this emulation, this makes media preservation much easier. I have a Model 16B with a working floppy drive. I have one working 8-inch floppy drive that I got going again, and I use it along with an emulator so I can image disks back and forth. So, um, now, I'll warn you, if you're playing with those floppy drives, especially the thin line ones, they're a novelty. Don't use them for anything real. They have a really nice habit of the disk eject spring not clearing the head fast or pushing the media out before the head clears it, and so the media rips the head off. And you don't know until you put the next disk in and it chews up your disk. So, snapping action. Or um, a lot of folks would mod them by disabling the eject spring so that you didn't just destroy your media. But the, the floppy drives on these things are for nostalgic purposes only at this point, um, at least in my opinion. The Model 2 archive. Everything that has been found, documented, is on the Model 2 archive. A man by the name of Peter Satinsky maintains it. The community contributes. I've contributed a couple of things. Um, this is a mix of all sorts of great stuff for the Model 2. Sard software, hardware, tech documentations. If Tandy is known for one thing, their technical documentation is fantastic. Um, and there is a lot of it. And it has been preserved. A lot of people have put in a lot of work to preserving this stuff. So like I said, joking about accounting before, somebody thought to preserve this, or it, or it stuck around and someone found it. A lot of stuff gets found places. Um, software. So on the Model 2 archive, we've got operating systems, Tristos, Xenix, CPM, Charles Rivers Unos, which is a story of its own, um, and a really obscure operating system called Oasis. We've got word processors, spreadsheets, Deskmate, the theme of this presentation being Deskmate 3, um, the friendly face in the PC crowd. Diagnostic software, um, the TRS-80 diagnostics and their documentation are up there and are fantastic. Um, they, do, they test all ends of the system, Z80, 68,000, what have you. Doc, uh, docs, manuals, tech bulletin, service doc, etc. Um, first place you always start, technical bulletins. Tandy did a lot of hardware revisions. Us TRS-80 side systems get this a lot. So one of the first things you, if you ask in any of the forums, someone's say, hey, uh, have you done the technical bulletin yet? And you're going to look at the list and go, 23 of these things, and then break out the iron. Um, I did that once. I did like 10 TBs on a hard drive controller once. I was there for like three days. 
and there's cool stuff. So in addition to all the old stuff that's been preserved, there's actually new hardware and software for these things. So there's a Z188 CPU acceleration upgrade. These are USB keyboard adapter. These keyboards are foam and foil Keytronic keyboards. I loathe doing these keyboards. I would rather desolder and resolder the key switches on a Model 4 keyboard than push those stupid little discs in there and get them to stick. Um, and if you don't have a keyboard, a lot of these systems you'll find you may not have a keyboard. Now you can plug a USB keyboard into it. Uh, PAL MMU upgrades for the 68,000 side. You can go up to 8 megs of memory. There's an SRAM upgrade for this. Seven and a half, um, quirk of the memory map. There's a real-time clock. Um, and there's a option for Model 12s. You got yourself a Model 12 without a card cage. There are options now. There is a new backplane uh, by a group called Tandy Emeritus. Um, they have a seven slot backplane and there is a chassis into which you can install that backplane. So you can now uh, add cards to your Model 12. And again, we have a very active community now. There's a lot of us, we're friendly folks. Um, there's, I think there's a perception sometimes that Tandy can get a little siloed in our, you know, we're the Z80 folks and we're the Coco folks. And we're, um, it's not that siloed. There's actually a lot of, um, you know, friendly back and forth between all of us in the different systems. We all have different interests and you can tell who's interested in what, but uh, everyone's very friendly, very eager to help. I've, I've been welcomed uh, into the community and been very, very happy for it. And there's an emulator. This is um, TRS-80 GP, is a fantastic emulator. And if I have time, I'm gonna demo it for you today. Um, TRS-80 GP emulates models one, three, four, color computer, MC-10, uh, the terminals, video text, and it also does the model two line systems. It doesn't do the color computer three at the moment. Um, I think it's coming, but I don't wanna <laughs> put that on. Um, but I did hear that. So what are my Tandy systems? You know, what's the retrospective part of this? Well. My first system was a Model 16, what we sometimes now call the Model 16A. And I broke a cardinal rule. Younger me was not as wise as now slightly older me is. I shipped it. Don't do that. Uh, fortunately, the person that shipped it was fairly close, just out of driving distance, and I went back and forth with him for a couple of weeks on how we get this thing packed to survive. Um, I pictured, uh, anybody here watch Ace Ventura, Pet Detective? Yeah, the opening scene of that movie. That's pretty much what I think every delivery person does with everything I ever order. And this survived, so this is it. Um, this machine is a bit of a unicorn. That little sticker on the bottom actually has, says Tandy 6000 upgrade kit installed. So this has the faster uh, CPU, 68000, and it has the larger memory boards. This was upgraded from Radio Shack. This is the only one I know of, and it works um, eventually. But it didn't work when I got it. <laughs> Um, not only did it need some Rifa replacement, but a couple of other electrolytics had exploded and got electrolyte everywhere. Um, there was some logic that needed to be done. That foam and foil keyboard, I, in my first videos in this, I made the assumption that it was not foam and foil because I didn't know. But I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll just desolder the switches. And then I got in there and went, ugh. And this was before the Texelec pads. There are replacement pads from Texelec now. Um, this was before that. So I had it apart for weeks. But... I finally got it working. I've been going back and forth with the power supply on this thing for the better part of three days. Her, my wife's family was over and I was kind of camping out in the basement trying to get this thing going. I just turned it on, thought, ah, heck, it's not gonna work and turned around and I heard chunk. And that was when you fire, fire these up, the floppy drive does a seek out to set uh, track five and then back to zero. And the head was frozen, but it tried and it lit up. That insert to get prompt is passed about five diagnostics. So if you get there, that is a very good sign for your system. And then there it is, I have a floppy emulator hooked up script that's running on it. Um, this machine is probably the one I'm, this is the first one that I really bought back that wasn't just power supply problems, like as I was kind of learning this. All of my electronics background is self-taught, so. Then I got a Model 12. Um, these things are like potato chips, Lay's potato chips, you can't have just one. I thought I got my big Tandy system, I'm fine. Nope, Mr. Wizard had the Model 12, I wanted my Model 12. I uh, drove to New Jersey to pick this one up. Um, seller had done the keyboard for me. Um, this one has the annoying keyboard where they tried to go IBM style with the raised center of the enter keys. I don't love that keyboard. Um, this one had the emulator came with it and the do that's the binder documentation. Tandy documentation from this era of systems is fantastic. There's that card cage or lack thereof. Neutered Model 12. You know, it's, it's like the buttons when you cheap out on a car and there's the blanks where all the buttons should go. And this is it, I'm dialing into Xenix using a direct connect modem, DCM6, and that's a Chronophone 255 from Radio Shack, the phone clock radio, because Radio Shack had everything. Finally, I got a 16B. Um, this one did not work when I got it. 
And this one is now my only machine with a working floppy drive. That was the last thing I got fixed. Um, but uh, this was the machine is what finally got me to get an oscilloscope. Um, one thing you'll learn with these machines is they, they tend to be picky and you want to learn your way around a scope if you want to poke around in them. It's not necessarily necessary, but eh, um, I did. And actually, actually me with the 8 meg SRAM uh, built next to it and the MMU upgrade that I'm about to put in. And I do have this 8-inch floppy drives there, or floppy disks there. I did find new old stock media um, for not ridiculous eBay prices once. So the focus on this and for new hardware is Model 12 expansion. Um, throughout these, I, I don't need them. There's a couple of options already available, but if you want the 68,000 subsystem or you want a hard disk, you want anything, you need expansion on the Model 12. And the way the Model 12 comes out of the box with that lack of card cage is there's one slot on the main board and there's a video card plugged into it. And that's where the card cage goes there, video card moves to the, the thing. So expansion has come back. I designed a my first ever 3D printed designed thing that I've released, a card cage solution. Um, it's, I call it crude, um, others uh, disagree, but it is, it is a fairly new person's attempt at, I, I struggle in 3D spaces as it goes. Um, this was my first multi-part thing and trying to get something that it connects with something else that someone designed and get all those measurements right and reinforcing it. I learned a lot. Um, so that's freely available on GitHub. You can make it yourself. You do need a fairly large volume printer, 256 by 256 by 256. Um, or a craft cloud, Shapeways, etc. Shapeways does the best job, but it will cost you a lot of money, but by far the best. Um, and the seven slot backplane, uh, Tandy Emeritus seven slot backplane, and it is better than the Tandy one. The legacy backplane was just your seven slots and your power connector. This has additional connectors on it for bus expansion, so you can bring the bus out of the system to use with other uh, hardware. There's LEDs on it. You need status LEDs. Everything has to have lights. I like lights. Apparently the designer likes lights because there's status lights for the 5, 12, and minus 12 volt rails. Um, and this is a build it yourself thing. One thing you will find with these systems because they're not mass appeal, a lot of the stuff you can buy for this hardware-wise, you're, you're gonna be putting together yourself. So, or pay a friend. Um, so let's take a look. So this is the TE backplane. Um, you can see on the, the right, there's the, we call them IDE connectors. It's those IDC 40 pin, you know, but most people think of them as IDE connectors. Um, they bring the bus out. Um, there's jumpers alongside the slots. So if you wanna pull a card out and you don't wanna have to move your, resh reshuffle your cards, you can jump the bus master interrupt chains up to the next slot. That's really cool. Um, all new, the AMP 80 pin connectors are the hardest thing to find for these. Um, a place called Nebraska Surplus Sales has them. There is a similar connector that kind of works, but um, I've been told it doesn't quite fit right. And actually behind you, my soldering iron, you can see some of the other Tandy Emeritus stuff I have yet to build. Um, and this is it with my, um, with my card cage. So the card cage goes right into the machine. You see my LED status indicators, and that's it with the machine put together with a hard disk interface board and the video controller. So you can now expand to Model 12, which means I single hand, or well, single, I have helped contribute to the ever increasing eBay prices of 6,000 CD hardware because I made the things so you could buy all this stuff. So I thank myself later. They have more. Um, this is a Tandy Emeritus, especially um, a group of uh, former engineers and folks from Tandy Corp, and also make up the group, but also work with Tandy Emeritus kind of from the outside. Um, those folks have the 8 mag SRAM card and that's got the real-time clock on it. There's a USB keyboard adapter that you can use if you don't want to, or don't have or don't want to refoil a keyboard. And there's a diagnostic uh, test fixture and diagnostic spacer. And the diagnostic spacer and test fixture are fantastic. If you want to work on these cards, you need to get them out of the machine. You need to be able to poke them with the scope, but you need to keep the card order intact, right? So what you can do is bring out the bus, either using that diagnostic spacer in one of the slots or using the expansion on the end of the, on the end of the back plane, depending on what you're doing. And you can put it out on a fixture that goes on your desk. It's fantastic. And so you can probe it with a scope. You can jump past, you know, there's bus uh, jumpers for jumping the bus and the in, you know, bus master interrupt chains up, all that stuff. Um, and the eight mag is seven and a half because the 68,000 memory map has the top half, half meg reserved for the system. And there's more. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Ian Maverick in Australia also has a bunch of options, reproduction hardware and such for the Model 16 systems. If you have one of those high-res graphics cards that seem to be showing up on eBay all of a sudden that don't have the cables, uh, he makes a cable set. Um, he also, he sells the F48, the hard drive adapter, and he now sells a reproduction hard disk interface board so you can use it. Um, before he had the F48, but the interface board was not 
a thing. He has a reproduction and he sells it. He also sells a three slot expansion. A uh, man by the name of Hans Reitfeld uh, made a three slot expansion that was available. So if you wanted to expand your Model 12 and you didn't need the 68,000 subsystem, you just wanted to add hard disk or graphics or something, you could do that. My Model 12 used to have that in there. I, I took it out. Um, he also does TRS-80 Model 134 color computer. He's got some Apple II stuff. Definitely um, check him out. He's really friendly, um, great to deal with. Um, same with the Tandy Emeritus folks. So some software resources here. Um, falling behind, but there's a new version of Xenix, Xenix 3.4 to support the 8 meg upgrade, MMU and all that great stuff. The Model 2 archive has a ton of great software and as seen on Adrian's digital basement, the diagnostic ROM has been ported to the Model 2. And of course, there's additional references. Um, TRS80.com, Ira Goldklang's site, the Tandy Assembly, the yearly Ohio meetup of Tandy Assembly or Tandy folks get together. Check out their YouTube page. They have a lot of live presentations on there and it's a good reference point for these systems. Um, and there is a TRS80 cards reference as well. I apologize, it didn't come out as nicely on the screen as I had hoped as it does on my laptop screen. Um, and I can pop these links around. I realize you guys don't really have them. So um, this is great if you get a card and you don't know what it is, or you wanna know what, what was available. And there's more, um, Ian's TRS80.com. He makes the various bits there. We talked about that. Uh, Mark J. Blair's FD50-34. to 34. If you wanna use a HXC GoTech with your agent system, you're gonna want that. Some people do pre-assemble those, but this is the GitHub page for that. He also has power supply options. You can use a meme well and build yourself a, a, a dongle the wire it in so you don't have to use the uh, Radio Shack power supply. And there's even a 3D printed bracket to fit it in the case. Uh, TRS 8-bit newsletter, another great place to go. They publish fairly frequently and uh, it covers all the systems. There's a lot of discussion in there. If something fun happens in the community, it probably ends up in TRS 8-bit. And the TRS 80 Trash Talk podcast, uh, they meet semi-regularly, semi do uh, a regular discussion panel for the various TRS-80 systems. These systems come up a lot in there. They also do uh, occasional live meetups, and I've been on them a couple of times. Uh, the first time I was on there, I actually spilled a beer in my lap. That was fun. <laughs> I almost, uh, it was better than my, it was gonna go to the keyboard of my Tandy 4825SX. So I, I saved the computer at the expense of my shorts. So I'll say, uh, so uh, before we get to q and I'll say thank you, and I'll leave you with a quote from War Games. I think everyone's favorite movie. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Stephen Falcon is talking to General Behringer, and he says, General, you were listening to a machine. Do the world a favor and don't act like one. Yeah. I think all too often, whether in computing or in life, I think we kind of get a little binary and reflexive in our reactions to people. And there's more than bin binary. Uh, you know, we're more than binary. And so take a second. You know, we may not all be perfect, but we could, we could stand to turn the temperature down a bit. Um, so I'll do a quick demo of uh, TRS-80 GP just to give you an idea. Uh, can I full screen you? Hopefully I can get out of this. Okay, so this is the uh, TRS-80 GP. And I should note, TRS-80 GP has a debugger. It does SIO and PIO tracing, memory tracing, very comprehensive. This is a fantastic emulator for any TRS-80 system you're gonna emulate. There's others out there. This one's the best. Uh, disassembly, live disassembly. Um, when I was figuring out the SIO subsystem, I got most of the way there and just didn't really feel like trying to figure out the clock rate settings for the SIO. So I cheated and I used the trace function on TRS-80 GP to have it tell me what to put to the command register so I didn't have to do it myself. Oh, lovely. Well, we're gonna do that. Um, well, well, that goes. Um, so yeah, TRS-80 GP, this is running Xenix. Um, this is the, emulating both the Z80 and 68000 side, supports hard disks, floppy disks, all sorts of great stuff. It even does uh, serial I.O. over TCP. So you can do uh, that kind of thing with it, and this may or may not get done. So while this is going, um, I will do questions, if there are any. I'll come back to that. Oh, and I have the websites up too, so I'll just put those up and we're done. So yeah, that's that. Um, have we got time? We'll, we'll see. The file system cleans, standard Unix. So, uh, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, when Radio Shack went to public, so mm -hmm. to speak, uh, do you know where exactly actually their archives ended up, or where a lot of the documentation they would have ended up at? No, um, I know that, one, well, actually, a bunch of it went to um, an engineer named Frank Durda, a software engineer, Frank Durda 4. Um, he passed away a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Um, and his wife actually recently, in the last couple of years, donated that collection to some of the communities, so they're going through it. He has a lot. 
Um, he actually has a lot of documentation. His, his story is on Usenet. If you're on Usenet poking around, check out his writings. Um, he talks a lot about the, hand, the history of Tandy, um, how working with Microsoft was back then. Let's just say the reputation is well earned. Um, and a lot of stories about the Bowling Ball DOS story. That's where I learned that. Um, but a lot of that stuff, Radio Shack parts and stuff tended to go to National Parts, Waltz. Um, but the documentation and stuff, a lot of that stuff just got punted and AST wasn't interested. So if it was there, you know, folks took what they took, but um, a lot of it, you know, is stuff that people took home with them from, from my understanding. Um, you know, Tandy's exit was a little abrupt uh, in that they kind of had three bad releases. Three things happened in the fall of 1992, plus a little bit of a fourth that caused them to kind of lose it. Um, DEC, they were making x86 systems for digital equipment. Um, DEC told them in 1992, we know how to do it, we're going to make our own, and that was about 40% of their manufacturing capacity. Um, so, in fact, when they were talking with AST, it was for the reverse. It was for Tandy to make their systems, and that got flipped. Uh, the digital compact set came out. Tandy had exclusive U.S. manufacturing rights on it. That didn't sell well. People didn't see the need. Uh, the Tandy Sensation was a half sensation, but it used AdLib Gold as a standard, which promptly went out of business as the machine came out. Nothing on the machine was upgradable, and it quickly became an albatross. And finally, Memorex VIS, the single biggest reason why Tandy no longer makes computers, or no longer made computers. There's one over in the Tandy assembly wing, and it's an underpowered 286 set-top box with a set with a CD-ROM drive with about a 375 millisecond access time. Um, it was slow, uh, but it's, it's a neat piece of hardware. So, yep. Any other question? So how much of your collection works? And when you were getting started, you said it, it I mean, you, your first one didn't work. Mm -hmm. how, did you have to go back to manufacturers to get the parts? Or were you able to scavenge stuff? How did you fix it? <laughs> so um, fortunately, uh, most of the collections built over time. Uh, my Color Computer 3 is my original one. Uh, the Model 4, I have one of my four Model 3s and 4s is the original. Um, by the time I really started collecting most of these machines, I just had the three for many years, the 1000SX, the Model 4, and the Color Computer. Um, I didn't really start buying these machines until 2015, 16. Um, so by that point, it's all whatever I can get off the shelf. Fortunately for a lot of these systems, especially your older Model 4s or a lot of these 16s, they don't use any of the um, scaled you know, VS VLSI type chips or anything, ASICs or anything. So uh, commodity off the shelf stuff works for most of these things. Um, you can still find Z80s, eh? uh, rest in peace Z80, um, that got killed, rest in peace. Um, but it's been mostly whatever I can find, DigiKey, um, Jameco, that kind of thing, Mouser. Yep. Um, and I didn't, I, for the community stuff, I really wasn't, documentation was whatever I could find. Um, the color computer side has a whole archive that is everything is just right there. Um, and they've had that. It's a really very cool. If you have a color computer interest, check out the color computer archive. Um, fantastic. But most of it's off the shelf. And then the Model 2 archive for these machines, the service documentation, that's been a godsend to me because it tells you, gives you waveforms, timings, you know, resistance values. It gives you the hard drive um, diagnostic and, and alignment procedure. In fact, there's videos on YouTube for that. Um, so yeah, uh, the, most of the collection works. Uh, the picture that I had up, um, all but two machines on that picture work. Um, almost all the machines work. All three of my 8-inch systems work right now. That's kind of a miracle. I don't know how many times I'm going to turn the thing on and something blows up. But <laughs> yes. I just want to say how much I really enjoyed this presentation because I knew almost nothing about any of these machines. And I grew up in Fort Worth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, Radio Shack stores were everywhere. Yeah, they're right up. Those they're right next door. I'm trying to wonder where they were in Fort Worth. Maybe they kept them locked up in the Tandy Center or something. Yep, I yep, know, so I yep. Um, yeah, and it's funny because, like I said, they were not really the most known systems in general. Uh, but, it, I mean, the architecture is fascinating. I'm the kind of person that just... If you were to picture my career, take the OSI model and look at the top half of layer one and go to the bottom half of layer six, and that's about where you're going to find me. Um, and I bounced around all over in there um, from hypervisor to operating system into the network and up. So um, that is influenced by, but also I influence my, where I'm interested in these systems and the levels. If I, for those of you who watch my YouTube channel, I have a reputation for doing dumb, unnecessary things. Like I booted OS 9 from a cassette tape once because <laughs> why the hell? Wrote the bootloader to do it. Why? Because hold my beer, right? Question in the back? Cards, 
they're physically separated on different buses? No, nope, they're they're on the same bus. Um, the, you know, the, the back plane, the same back plane. But from a hardware standpoint, all of the hardware is done on the Z80 side. So um, the 68000 doesn't use any of the, the Z80 bus lines logic, anything like that. At least not in that for the hardware sense. So does the 68000 have access to the hardware directly? Nope. 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 All of it goes through a shared memory window that is running. So in the case of Xenix, that first boot prompt was a program called Z80 CTL which is the operating system, kind of the, the brain of the hardware side for the Z80. And what it does is, as I'm typing on the keyboard here, I'm going to log in. Um, this, it's my keystrokes, uh, emulated, are Xenix is going, hey, I need to send keyboard keystrokes out. And the Z80 CTL picks that up, performs the action, and gets back to, uh, gets back to the 68,000, usually interrupt driven, but you know. So, and there's a 16K memory window. So the 64K address space on the Z80 side has the Z80 CTL itself, buffers, and then there's a, from, I think, 8000 to Fox is the memory window. All the code runs in 68K. Yep. And you don't, you don't write any code in the Z80. Right. And now the thing that comp this design complicates, actually, what time is it here? Oh, I've got a couple minutes, is that if you want to add hardware support to Xenix, you can't unless you can get it into Z80 CTL. So, for example, the graphics card didn't work until Xenix 3.2 because it wasn't supported in Z80 CTL. Um, I'm running into an issue now where I want to do direct manipulation of the DTR and RTS lines on the serial port, but I don't know that I can do that because it looks like the way Z80 CTL is written, Xenix kind of does it and Z80 CTL does it under the covers, and I haven't yet found a way to tell, I want to flip DTR on, I want to flip it off, which is going to mess up a project for me real good. Um, but this is Xenix, so here we have, you know, it's, it's your usual, and the great thing is, like, I've got VI, I've got all my stuff, it's multi-user. By the way, the name Midgar is from Final Fantasy VII, if you happen to catch that. Um, you know, I've got thing applications like Deskmate and all kinds of great stuff. Multi-user, basic, there's an, inter, there's, a, there's an integer basic on here. Um, the friendly face in the PC crowd. This is much like the Model 134 version. In fact, it uses the same logic for the date, but they just keep incrementing 8, 9, semicolon, right? Um... I don't know what's in secret.doc here, but yep. So um, this is TRS-80 GP. You can play with this. You can play with all the software out there. So experience, <laughs> it probably is the most secure document on the planet. Um, I always thought if I want to really hide something, I'll do it in OS 9 or I'll do it in Xenix, yes. Yeah, if, if someone wanted to take a dive into the hardware, mm -hmm. um, is there one model that has the least easiest barrier of entry? The, 12, the 16B and the 6000 are the easiest in my mind because the card cage is accessible. Um, the, they're a little bit of a beast to get apart, the earlier case designs, but the later ones, they fix that. Um, but from an accessibility standpoint, and more is consolidated on the 12 and up. Um, the, the 12 consolidates all but the video circuitry from the Model 2, which is the discrete cards for the CPU and the Z80 memory. Puts that all together on a logic board and then you just have the expansion cards in the video. So those are easier by far. And now with the card cage, the Model 12 becomes a thing. Um, but that's, that's where I would say from a hardware standpoint, you should start. Um, I'd strongly recommend against shipping. Again, slightly wiser me knows better now. I got really, really, really lucky, but there's tons of horror stories on pictures of machines that just get trashed. So, um, yes? Uh, what were the production or sales numbers for all these? Products? That's a great question. Um, and I say that because Tandy was never big about sales numbers. Um, even now, um, there are folks, especially in the Cocoa side, they think might know, but they won't say. Um, every so often in like a Tandy newsletter or something, they would give you a rough idea years later, but Tandy was never big on sales numbers, which there's a belief in the, you know, that that, that might kind of feed why Tandy appears to not be much. And nobody knows, they don't, you know, you didn't see them in Sears everywhere. There weren't six million of them because we don't know if there were six million of them, but maybe there were. There were millions of color computers, um, but these machines, you know, not so much, well, hundreds of thousands of color computers, but yes. In your research, have you come across any, like, what might have been if Tandy had kept going on? Did they have plans for making more of these? That's a great question. So by the time Tandy punted, everything that was not MS-DOS was gone. Um, even the last Tandy 1000 was actually just a 386SX. Um, the, they had started in 1992. They had started a build-to-order program. You could within call or go to a radio shack, within 72 hours, you had a machine at your doorstep, custom configuration. They even put your name on the nameplate. Tandy, 425SX for Chris. 
Um, that went away quick. The last generation of cases, what they call the OmniProfile cases, um, did. That's where that came, the kit style of the machines. I have a Tandy MMPC Model 20 that I just got actually that has that kit style build design. So if they had gone, my own speculation, if they had gone on, they could have done what Dell has done with online because that would have been the next logical step. They already had the build order program. Radio Shack was everywhere. So you had a place with stores. They could have really commanded it. I mean, the PC became commodity hardware. And one of the common things I see here is Tandy couldn't make any money. Well, no, Tandy didn't, couldn't make Radio Shack margins that they were used to. Um, and VIS, I think the estimate was they lost 75 million on that one project alone. They stopped making them in January of 93, announced it in the fall, sold it for way too much money, and it was a plug-in disaster. Virtually impossible to sell, some people called it. So, yeah. Um, probably get one more. And if not, then awesome. Thank you. So, and check out tandy-emeritus.org um, if you want hardware for these and Ian Maverick's site, www.fredfreh.com.